as you may recall from other episodes of the case of the week, there are certain stickers that um, you never want to see on your box when it's in the lab. And here's one of them, undercut. This is the summer of the undercut. We've been talking about this a lot. And it's really because it's not that it's anything new. It's just that we have a new way to look at it and a new way to evaluate it because of the digital technology we have. And because of the fact that every time we receive an impression like this, we pour it. Uh, in dental stone and then we take it to the scanner and we scan it once it's in stone so we pour the model and then it goes into our model scanner and we scan it we begin to work on it in the digital environment because we love digital it allows us to take a uh, model like this which is a prescription for a brux or crown on tooth number four and immediately digitally design it and then mill it but the issue as you saw from the undercut sticker was that we have some undercuts here and as we look back and forth, visually we can see the undercuts as we try to be able to see all the margins at the same time. And when we scan it, it allows us to move around the path of insertion as well and see actually where the undercuts might be. And for example, in this model, so with this, is, this represents with the model sitting like this, as you can see in the scan right here. When we take a slice in it diagonally through this direction, right here through this part, right at the mesolingual line angle, actually just a little uh, into the contact from there, uh, we can see we have an undercut there of 0.17 millimeters, which is 170 microns. And as we look um, towards the posterior on the distal lingual, we have an undercut of 200 microns there, and both of these uh, undercuts exist and are very difficult to deal with in a situation like this. And so there's a decision that has to be made here when we call the doctor, and the doctor needs to decide what they want to do. In fact, we very minor undercuts. We're talking, say, a tenth of a millimeter and less. Uh, you can usually make those work without having to do um, too much uh, to the crown itself um, and, or the preparation for that matter. It really gets, uh, starts to get dicey as we get around uh, 0.15 millimeters or 150 microns of undercut. That's where all of a sudden we aren't able to do what we'd like to be able to do. And of course, part of all this is based on the adjacent teeth. So if the adjacent teeth weren't here and all we had was the preparation, the brux or crown that was milled, would fit on, oops, would fit on <laughs> relatively nicely and, uh, and not be an issue. But of course, if we're going to set this in the model now, that's not going to happen because of the undercuts. That has not been stained or glazed or polished yet uh, at this point, as you can tell. And so when we design a crown that has undercuts, um, the Bruxer mills will actually mill in an undercut. That's really not the issue. It's more the issue that the bigger the undercut gets, even though we can mill it into the crown, the crown will then not fit down onto the tooth. And so there has to be some adjustment made to the inside of the crown to kind of uh, compensate for that. And that's where the difficulty comes in because it starts to play with the margin. So for example, if, it, if a dentist tells us to just kind of go for it. Like if we look at a preparation here, and we'll have a preparation, we'll have the margin come up like this and maybe end, and here's the, the root of the tooth, and the prep's gonna come up, and the prep's gonna come over. And as it comes over, we're gonna have it really kind of undercut here, and that's where we're gonna have our margin. It's gonna be right along in here, but the undercut at the margin, which we see a lot of, is now below the height of contour, which is right about here. So if you tell the software to ignore it when it makes the crown, it will design a crown that's gonna be a reasonable looking crown. Uh, and it will also, it'll come over here and it'll, it'll make it kind of look like it's supposed to look down to this margin over here, even though we have an undercut. But again, when we take this crown and mill it now, and it's now solid zirconia, pre-sinted, so it's a little easier to adjust. When the adjacent teeth are here, this crown won't go down. So we need this crown to seat in a vertical direction, even though the path of insertion is over to the side. If we didn't have adjacent teeth, it would not be a big deal, but we have adjacent teeth. And so essentially what the technician now has to do is come into the inside of this crown and start grinding away at the bruxer at the inside of the crown until it negates the undercut. And the problem is when you do that, when you grind all of this away, you begin to open the margin down here. So instead of having a margin that's open, say, 50 microns, by the time you grind this away, this might be open 200 microns. 
And that begins to be problematic, obviously, when we have, even with the resin cement, we you know, don't want to have a margin like that. But when a dentist says, uh, do your best, see if you can make it go down, and I'll try to make it fit and use a resin cement, uh, this is, in effect, what we're, we're being asked to do, and we don't feel great about it. So that starts at about 0.15 millimeters, and that goes up all the way to about, say, three-tenths of a millimeter, 0.30 or 300 microns. If the undercut's beyond that, um, this won't even work. Uh, well, we'll still have to do a little of this, but we'll also have to give this doctor a reduction coping that's going to fit, you know, onto this tooth. I'm sorry, this isn't a different color. And this reduction coping is going to have to come down across here, showing the doctor where they need to prep away all this tooth structure. We need a little more there. All this tooth structure to get rid of that undercut so the crown will fit. So we do a little adjustment to the inside of the crown and the dentist needs to use a reduction coping on an axial surface, which is kind of difficult, actually much easier to use a reduction coping on an occlusal surface for a cuss tip. So when we have undercuts and the dentist says, go ahead and try it and see what you can do on a single unit like this, if it's small enough, you know, we can just make an adjustment to the crown and, and, and hope it doesn't open the margin too much. We'd prefer the doctor fix the prep and take a new impression. But sometimes if it's big and the dentist just wants to try something in the mouth so the patient can see they tried it, we'll do the reduction coping as well because now if the dentist does the reduction coping, tries the crown on it, still doesn't fit, he's ready to take uh, a new impression to have a new restoration made. So that happens on single units from time to time, but much more frequently it happens on bridges. And again, this is a uh, three unit bridge prep and you can see you know, pretty clearly here that we've got um, some undercuts there. If we look at the actual numbers themselves, you can see that on the mesial of the molar, we have our two undercuts. And uh, on the lingual, it's going to be at uh, 0.20. And on the buckle, it's at 0.27. So again, we have two undercuts here on the molar. And you can see both of them marked with a red pencil right there. And again, we've got the gingival margin in the shadow of that undercut. And so for this to insert the way it needs to insert, yes, we can make an undercut, but the technicians have to grind it all away. So it's hollow in here, essentially, on the bridge to get it to go down. Because obviously, if we take out you know, both these teeth, the Bruxer bridge will fit on the two individual teeth. That's not going to be the issue. The issue is going to be as they start to grind away here. And you can see grinding away how it begins to open if the doctor's not willing uh, to take a new impression. And I don't know if they're, I just grabbed this actually off the tech's bench. I'm not sure if they're done with this grinding yet. Okay, they are done with the grinding. So it goes down, but you can see what it does to the margin uh, when that happens. Uh, by definition, it's gonna, when you go in and grind that out, it's gonna open that margin to change that path of insertion. Really the right way to change that path of insertion is in fact to go back and prep. Or really the best way is to not have this happen in the first place. And at the end of this, I'm going to explain to you something we've been doing with a few select doctors that we're having some great success with. A little bit of a hassle, but it's a neat way to be able to avoid undercuts um, altogether. And so this is something that is more common and more endemic to bridges. Here's just another bridge that I happen to grab. So the more typical thing is that we see that mesial tilt to the lower molar, as you see there. But this one, we have a distal tilt uh, of the second bicuspid as well. And so when we look at the scan of this model, we actually see a 0.26 uh, millimeter undercut on the mesial of the molar and a 0 0.30, 300 microns on the distal of that bicuspid. And so this is definitely gonna, again, there's the undercut area marked and the undercut area marked on the molar as well. And so yes, the bridge you know, can be fabricated, but it's gonna take, it would take so much grinding here that there's just no way it would work. If I take these out, it's going to fit on each of these preps individually, but it's not going to fit on them simultaneously. And this is the uh, example where even though a doctor says do your best, we're going to have to send a bridge that's been adjusted on the inside and reduction copings, especially on this bicuspid, so he can go in and straighten up that wall and tilt this back towards the mesial in order to have a chance of this bridge fitting. If it doesn't fit, you know, just by straightening up this wall and putting a little more mesial uh, angulation on it, he's going to be able to take a new impression and we can make uh, a bridge that fits at that point. So at least the doctor gets to try this into the patient's mouth 
and make a good faith college effort. And then when it doesn't fit, say, boy, the lot, the lab got something wrong here. Uh, I could play with this a little bit more, probably get it to fit, but I really don't want to Mickey Mouse this. I want this to last uh, decades, not days, or years, not days. Uh, I tell you what, let's just let, let, let's take a new impression and send it to the lab. I'm sure they'll get it right this next time. And usually the patient's going to be um, okay with that and not have an issue with it. So what have we been doing lately to kind of uh, get away from this, from getting away from having these types of undercuts? Well, with some of our doctors who have scanners, and so far we've just been doing it with um, like a couple Serona users, we've got doctors who, the way we have it set up now, we can actually share their computer screen on their scanner. And so when a doctor uh, scans this, before they scan it, they can actually put the camera in the mouth while one of our technicians looks at it live here at the laboratory. And as we look at it live with the scanner and capture that image, our software, if their software won't tell them, our software will tell us where these undercuts are. And so very quickly we can see where these undercuts are as if we couldn't see it when the dentist scanned it from the side. And we can say, doctor, can you go in and prepare the mesial, that molar, and tilt that, angle that back towards the distal for us? And the doctor will go to do that, dry everything off, put the camera back in again, and show it to us, and we'll capture that and put it into the software and say, that's good, just a little more right on the mesiofacial. And the dentist will do that and then rinse it off, dry it off, put the camera back in, and we'll say, good, the undercut is gone. Um, go ahead and take your digital impression. In fact, we can stay on the line and watch the dentist take the digital impression and make sure they've captured all the information that we need. This is fantastic because when they send that original scan to us or that original screen capture that we see as, they, as we see them move the uh, scanner in and out of the patient's mouth in real time, uh, the patient's still there, the patient's still anesthetized. This isn't getting them back, get the temp off, numb it up and go back in and reshape these. It's right at that moment and it's been a fantastic way for us to be able to uh, help Dennis out because it's really like having a live laboratory technician in your office over your shoulder who's got x-ray vision and can do calculations like this about undercut uh, in their mind. So we're becoming, uh, getting to the point where we're closer to releasing it to everybody who has a scanner where they have that capability. Uh, there was another guy the other day doing 10 maxillary anterior Emax crowns who was scanning the preps and we were showing a couple areas pointing out where he could do a little more preparation. And then once he took his digital impression, we showed him a couple spots where he could pick up just a little more by rolling the camera to the facial as he was doing the impression. And then by the time it goes to the laboratory, you know the preps and impressions are exactly where they want to be. So in the meantime, we're still stuck with dealing with undercut problems like this. And while there are a few things we can do to the inside of the crown, anytime we're asked to do that by a dentist, there's always a price to pay. And that price is uh, opening the margin uh, to a greater degree than it's already open. We're all shooting for 50 microns on our best day. And this will easily add another 100, 150 microns to that if a dentist asks us to do it. So uh, it behooves us to try to get this right and, and try to make sure that we look in the mouth with our one eye closed in our mirror, trying to see if we can sight down both of these down a path of insertion. Um, short of that, again, you know, we're happy to send reduction copings to help you get this right and even send a bridge along so you have something to try into the patient's mouth. And, uh, and then blame the lab. We'll take the blame on that one as the face, faceless laboratory. And hopefully as more dentists get scanners, we're going to see a move towards that virtual dental technician where the technician is, is watching your case uh, as you prep the case and is able to give you feedback in kind of real time uh, to tell you whether or not you've got an undercut, what you can do to correct it, and when you're finished. And they'll be able to fabricate a bridge without having to play around with the inside of it.